in progress. All right, everyone, it is a little after five now, so we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Rachel Rennick, and I'm part of the Community Outreach and Education Program here at Perlmutter Cancer Center. I would like to welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in virtually. Um, as many of you know, March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, so we have a great program tonight. We have inf information about risk factors, screening, nutrition and exercise, and treatment options. Um, I would like to thank all of our panelists for being here tonight. And just a couple quick things before we get started. Um, I just wanted to share with you some ways you can stay connected with Perlmutter Cancer Center. I have our website here and also our social media channels, which I wanted to encourage everyone to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We are very active on there. We post all of our events on there, all of our news. So it really is a great resource. So I'm just going to leave this up for a moment. And I'd also like to remind everyone that we will have time for questions at the end of webina the webinar. You should see a Q&A box on your screen. So feel free to type any questions you have from the speakers and we will take them at the end. And with that being said, I would like to turn the program over to our first speaker for this evening, Dr. Sophie Bazora, who is a gastroenterologist here at NYU. And we thank her for joining us. It's a pleasure having her every year. She's always so informative. So Dr. Bazora, Take it away. Thank you. Let me sharing. just uh, share the screen here. Still a little Zoom inept, so bear with me. It's okay, you're doing good. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, everyone. So thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'll be speaking about risk factors and screening guidelines for colorectal cancer. So no better time because March is actually Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So let's just start with the basics, some basics about anatomy so we can understand the terminology that I'll be using. So what are the colon and rectum and what is colorectal cancer? I'm not sure if you can see the arrow, but basically the colon is this kind of sideways C-shaped structure, right? It's basically a house for stool, it's a storage. Um, and the rectum is a part of the large intestine, but just the last part. So when we talk about um, you know, cancer of the large intestine, we're talking about colorectal cancer. So we're talking about not only this last part here called the rectum, but also this C-shaped area as well. So let's go through some myths and misconceptions about colorectal cancer. We'll talk about myths and mis misconceptions about the disease itself, about screening and prevention, and about treatment. So first, misconceptions about the disease. And we'll have a couple true or false questions here to kind of set the stage and get you guys thinking a little bit and make it a little bit more interactive in a way. So true or false, colorectal cancer affects men much more commonly than women. What do you think about this one? It's actually false. Everyone is at risk for developing colorectal cancer. The lifetime risk of colorectal cancer is about one in 20 or 5% over a, patient's, a person's lifetime. Colorectal cancer is actually the third most common cancer in the US and the second deadliest. Another true or false for you. Colorectal cancer rates and risk of death from the disease vary depending on race and ethnicity. Is this true or false? It's actually true, sadly enough. So colorectal cancer occurs across all races and ethnicities, but at different rates. Black and American Indian and Alaska Native populations actually have the highest rates of colorectal cancer. So we're seeing it most often in these uh, groups. Black people, however, are 40% more likely to die from colorectal cancer compared to white people. Hispanic or Latino populations have the lowest screening rates compared to other races and ethnicities. So there are a lot of health disparities that are present within colorectal cancer. Another true or false for you. Colorectal cancer usually causes symptoms, especially in its early stages. It's actually false. During the early stages, most people with colorectal cancer have no symptoms at all, which is why screening and prevention is so incredibly important. So it's also important though, to know the signs of colorectal cancer. Now it doesn't mean that if you have these symptoms, you automatically have colorectal cancer, but these are symptoms that should definitely bring you to the doctor. 
If you see blood in the stool, blood in the stool is always abnormal. It doesn't automatically mean colorectal cancer, but it's never a normal thing to see blood in your stool. There are a lot of reasons for blood in the stool, including colorectal cancer, but also a lot of other benign um, conditions of the anus or the rectum, but it deserves evaluation. Diarrhea or constipation that's new for you. Pencil-shaped stools, so we say a change in caliber of the stool. Abdominal pain or cramping that you just quite can't explain. Unintended weight loss, so you're just kind of dropping weight without really trying or with meager efforts. Weakness and fatigue that seems new or unexplained or just strange out of sorts. Or iron deficiency anemia, meaning that your blood counts are low as well as your iron stores. And sometimes this can be indicative of blood loss over a long period of time. So sometimes you can have uh, blood loss that you don't see with the naked eye, meaning that you don't see blood in the stool with your naked eye, but you could be losing it over time because of a growth in your large intestine. Another true or false, Colorectal cancer rates are dropping for people over 50 years old. That's true. So definitely good news there. Colorectal cancer rates are dropping for those over age 50. Most colorectal cancers are diagnosed in those over 50 years old, but the disease can affect people at any age. People with a family history of colorectal cancer, a history of inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis that you may have heard before, and those who carry certain genetic mutations are at increased risk for colorectal cancer at an earlier age. If your medical history tells us that you are at increased risk, or if you are having symptoms that I mentioned in the previous slide, you should be evaluated for colorectal cancer regardless of age. Unfortunately, early age onset colorectal cancer is becoming much more common. We call early age onset colorectal cancer those that occur in people below the age of 50. Rates are rising. So what we want to stress here is that it is critical to not ignore the symptoms. In the US, about 10 to 15% of colorectal cancers are of early onset. That's a pretty huge number considering the rise over the past couple of decades. Early onset cancers are usually found in the lower colon or the rectum, if you remember that diagram I showed earlier, and often present at advanced stages. There's a couple different reasons for this, some of which may be because blood in the stool or other symptoms are, kind of, are dismissed as something like irritable bowel syndrome or hemorrhoids. Um, and other reasons, you know, we don't quite know, does it have to do with diet or uh, you know, other environmental factors. What we know is that there's a lot of different factors at play, but not ignoring symptoms will get you diagnosed much more uh, quickly than if you just, you know, kind of write it off as something else. Early onset colorectal cancer usually presents with symptoms because oftentimes it presents at later stages. And when we say later stages, that means that the cancer has left the large intestine and has gone to other areas like lymph nodes or other organs like the liver. And so remember that despite rising rates, colorectal cancer in those under 50 is generally uncommon. It of course can happen and rates are rising. We need not ignore symptoms, but understand that the majority of folks who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer are indeed over 50 years old. Also remember that it is critical to know your family history. We say that family histories, family history secrets can be deadly, right? We can't keep secrets when it comes to family history. As you see in this graph here, if somebody has no family history of colorectal cancer, they're at average risk. If they have a family history of a precancerous growth that we call a polyp or an adenoma, the risk of colorectal cancer in that individual goes up. But when you have a first degree relative, a parent, a sibling, right, a, a child with colorectal cancer, the risk goes up still. And if that relative was young at the age of diagnosis, and we say young, as we mentioned earlier, under the age of 50, the risk continues to go up. So knowing your family history is so important because it tells us that you need to get screened much earlier and that you need to tell other family members that they ought to get screened too, because this really is about saving families, right? Ensuring that that longevity is there throughout your entire family tree by getting screened and doing something that you can easily prevent. So myths and misconceptions about screening. Colorectal cancer screening begins once you have symptoms of the disease. Is this true or false? 
it's false, right? What does it mean to undergo a screening test for colorectal cancer? Screening tests are those that we do for people who have no symptoms at all, right? There are both prevention and detection tests for colorectal cancer, making the disease highly preventable for over 90% of people. When you think about things like breast cancer, prostate cancer, right, lung cancer, colorectal cancer differs in that there are ways to prevent the disease from happening altogether, which is what makes screening tests so incredibly impactful. So make colorectal cancer screening an absolute priority Okay, a lot of people don't like seeing me, right? They don't like talking about their bowel habits. There's a lot of stigma that is attached to that, but ultimately colorectal cancer screening saves lives. Most colorectal cancers develop from polyps or small precancerous growths in the colon or large intestine, as I said, and these are called adenomas. Preventive screening tests find these precancerous polyps or adenomas so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Detection screening tests primarily function to detect early colorectal cancers, because as we said before, when you find the cancer early, your chance of survival is excellent. So generally, prevention tests are preferred over detection tests because we want to practice preventive health, right? We want to be proactive. But there are a lot of different screening options, um, and you just have to pick the one that's right for you, as we'll get into. So I said before, adenomas is the term. Those are benign precancerous polyps or abnormal growths along the colon wall. And so you see here on the left, a little picture of, uh, this is the colonoscope or the camera we use to do colonoscopy. And here we spot a polyp and we're removing it with this kind of lasso shaped structure. And then we put it in a jar, we send it off to pathology and there you have it, you've prevented colorectal cancer just like that. This is an actual picture of a precancerous polyp found during colonoscopy. So that's what it looks like. That's what we're looking for. True or false, preparing for a colonoscopy is difficult and the procedure is embarrassing and painful. I'll say it's false. Colonoscopies save lives and they're not as bad as some people may think. The procedure usually takes about 30 minutes. Most patients are sedated for the procedure should they choose to be to prevent any possible discomfort. And the steps needed to remove stool from the colon or what we call the colon prep may be the toughest part and an inconvenience, but the benefits of the procedure are huge. And so I love this little, this little meme um, because, you know, again, we know it's not a fun part of the procedure, but it is a necessary evil and again can save lives, right? Colonoscopy is the only way to screen for colorectal cancer. This is false. There are a lot of recommended screening tests for colorectal cancer. The preferred prevention test is colonoscopy. And for average risk individuals, it's to be done every 10 years. Average risk people begin at age 45. We say 45 is the new 50, right? Because the screening age used to be 50, but they've dropped it to 45. Begin earlier in high risk populations, as I mentioned before. You have a family history of colorectal cancer, you have inflammatory bowel disease, or other genetic mutations that predispose you to early colorectal cancer diagnosis. And there are preferred detection tests. The preferred detection test is one called the FIT test. It looks for hidden blood in the large intestine or the colon. And it's important to know that with a positive test, the next step is colonoscopy, right? We need to find out why it's positive. A positive test doesn't automatically mean colorectal cancer. It just means it warrants further evaluation. So ultimately the preferred test is the prevention test or colonoscopy. Alternatives to colonoscopy and FIT testing include a procedure called a flexible sigmoidoscopy. It's kind of like an abridged colonoscopy to be done every five years. And again, if there are polyps on that test, a full colonoscopy is warranted. Alternative detection tests or non-invasive tests are a special type of CAT scan, which does require a prep similar to the colonoscopy prep, or a stool-based DNA test that's done every three years. You've probably seen a lot of commercials on TV for it. And again, if polyps or early cancers are suspected, a full colonoscopy is the next step. So ultimately, all roads lead to colonoscopy. Is it safe to undergo colorectal cancer screening during the COVID-19 pandemic? Absolutely. Colorectal cancer does not wait. Experts estimate a greater than 1% increase in colorectal cancer deaths secondary to the pandemic. And there are safeguards in place to get you screened despite the pandemic. Discuss with your doctor which colorectal cancer screening test best fits your needs and your risk. 
and don't let fear prevent you from getting screened. There's nothing I can do to prevent colorectal cancer. It's just a matter of bad luck. It's absolutely false. There are ways to reduce your cancer risk. And I think the other speakers will go into this in a little bit more detail. Factors you can't change, being getting older, right? Your family history, you can't change your genes. And of course, a personal history of things like inflammatory bowel disease. Things you can change, things that are in your hands, right? Things that you have power over. Stop smoking, drinking alcohol in moderation, limit the red meat that you consume, eat leafy greens and fruits, maintain a healthy weight and be active. And of course, get screened on time, which is probably the most impactful of this list, which is why it's bolded. And treatment. More people are beating or surviving from colorectal cancer since the 1980s. Is this true or false? Thankfully, it's true. People do well when colorectal cancer is caught early. The five-year survival rate for colorectal cancer found at its earliest stage or stage one is 90% plus. When the cancer has spread, or as we say, metastasized, unfortunately, survival rates do diminish, which is why screening for colorectal cancer before the onset of symptoms is crucial. And screening with colonoscopy actually lowers colorectal cancer rates by over 50% studies have found. So remember, everyone is at risk for colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer screening begins at age 45. If you remember nothing else, for average risk folks, it begins at age 45 and even earlier in those who are at high risk. Know your family history. The best screening test is the one that gets done properly. Preventive screening tests are preferred over detection screening tests. Do not ignore symptoms of, your, of disease and don't let COVID-19 prevent you from getting screened. To learn more, there's these uh, wonderful resources available to you that are patient geared and patient centered. And I invite you to, um, to peruse them if you have any other questions that aren't answered in the time we have together. And I will stop sharing and hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Balsora. That was great. That was so informative and such an important message to get screened. Um, so thank you. All right, moving right along, I would like to introduce our next speaker who is going to talk to us tonight about surgery for colorectal cancer. So, uh, so I would like to welcome Dr. Joseph Shabart. Uh, good evening, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Great. Let me just share my screen. And we are on. So everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm here to speak about surgery for uh, the management of colorectal cancer. So that was a great, great talk by Dr. Belzora about um, when to get screened, why to get screened, the importance of getting screened. But even then, we still we still may have patients that either slip through the cracks and, and um, you know get their colonoscopy a little bit later, or even have their initial colonoscopy and are found to have colon cancer. So what happens then? Is it a death sentence? Is it treatable? Is it beatable? And you know, I'll ruin the punchline, but this is definitely a treatable and beatable disease. So now we can breathe and move on with what we're actually going to talk about. And I'm going to I'm going to describe you the the bridge or the path that you'll take from, from screening colonoscopy until um, you would meet with somebody like Dr. Schusterman, who's an oncologist. So um, we surgeons are very simple folks. So let's say we have a colon cancer that's in the right part of the colon or the middle, which is called the transverse or the left part of the colon or even the rectum. The goal of the surgery uh, in someone who has um, colon cancer confined to the colon is surgery to remove that portion of the colon. Very simple, we remove that portion of the colon, put it back together and remove the lymph nodes that go with it. Those lymph nodes will allow us to determine the stage of the tumor and whether or not those patients will need chemotherapy, uh, what type of surveillance they'll need and um, of their overall prognosis. So there's different approaches that uh, we utilize to perform surgery for the colon. The traditional approach is the open approach. So this is a traditional operation would require a long uh, incision in the abdomen. Uh, obviously it depends on where the colon is, but predominantly, I'm sorry, what part of the colon we would be operating on, but predominantly it would be a midline incision. 
And once you remove this, uh, we, we open the abdomen, you would see something that looks like this. This is obviously a, a model, but you see the colon is sort of surrounding the small intestines and, and uh, it borders the entire abdomen until it reaches the, the lower part, which is the rectum. And this is another photo here. You'll see this is the right colon um, over here, the transverse left colon and the rectum over here. So we remove the portion of the colon that has the cancer. The advantages of open surgery, obviously everything is in front of your face. You see it, uh, you can feel it and palpate it. And we could also see if there's any abnormalities in other portions of the colon. The disadvantages are that obviously there's more pain involved with an open incision. There's a higher risk of wound infections and tends to have a higher length of stay in the hospital. And uh, there's also some difficulty seeing in certain places like the upper abdomen on the left or deep down in the pelvis. So that's where laparoscopic and minimally invasive surgery comes into play. So some of you may have uh, heard of laparoscopic surgery for gallbladder or for other parts of the abdomen, appendectomy even. So we can do colon surgery as well. And this has been around for about 30 years, 25 years. It's been pretty popular. Uh, we put these little um, trocars or tubes in the colon. We blow up the colon with gas or carbon dioxide to be exact. And we use a long camera lens called the telescope to look inside in these little instruments called uh, laparoscopic uh, graspers to mobilize the colon and to remove the portion that has the cancer. Uh, it has the benefits obviously of smaller incisions, quicker recovery and a shorter length of stay. So a typical operation would have three or four incisions. Uh, I would tell patients about the size of your pinky nail or your thumbnail um, and they could be, depending on the portion of the colon, they'll be situated uh, as in the right picture or in the left picture. And this is a, a cartoon with the, with the uh, trocars in place. And this is what, how the abdomen would look prior to surgery. So I do have some videos, which is, are always neat. And you could see how the use of uh, laparoscopic surgery is uh, beneficial to the patient. Obviously, we're, we're not we don't have to open the abdomen here. We can see deeper uh, into the abdominal crevices. These are planes that are not visible um, to the naked eye. We have to separate the colon from the surrounding fat and the vital uh, vessels that are attached to it. And you can see here, we're lifting up the, uh, the right portion of the colon, separating it from its attachments along the, the uh, abdominal wall and taking all the lymph nodes with it. So within all this fatty tissue are the lymph nodes and the blood vessels of the colon. And that's uh, what's sent to the pathologists. So modern day, or at least the last 10 years, we've been using robotic uh, laparoscopic surgery. So it's the same premise as laparoscopic surgery in the sense that we're uh, inflating the abdomen with carbon dioxide. We're using these little tubes in the abdomen and, and instruments um, to perform the surgery. The only difference is instead of standing adjacent to the bed, um, we have a robotic console, as you can see on the left, uh, with the robotic arms going into the abdomen. And these are a little bit more precise as the, the wrists of the, of the instruments, instead of going two directions like chopsticks, um, are sort of like the wrists of your of your hand. You can you can go in eight different directions, and that gives us a lot more dexterity, and uh, um, gives us a better ability to uh, manipulate the bowel and to mobilize things. So this is a cartoon. I'm sorry, a video of um, of robotic surgery. It's obviously um, on fast forward. This is not how fast we operate, um, but you can see that uh, the visualization is actually uh, very neat. We're deep down in the pelvis right now. Uh, this is almost impossible to see this view if you're doing open surgery, uh, even with the best of retractions. So we're, we're near the lowest parts of the pelvis, mobilizing the rectum outside, the, outside of the pelvis in order to take all the surrounding lymph nodes um, along with the disease portion of the colon, which contains, or the rectum rather, which contains the cancer. I'm just gonna speed this up here even further. And you can see um, at the end result is the colon is, the rectum rather is mobilized 360 degrees and towards the end of the video, uh, we'll be ready to staple across it. And that's how we 
make our, our lower part of our resection and remove the, the, the disease portion of the rectum from the body. So once we remove the colon that has the cancer, uh, we need to perform what's called an anastomosis. An anastomosis is uh, a joining together or a connection of the two portions of the bowel. So a lot of fear goes into patients that come into my office saying, I don't want a bag. I'm worried that I'll come out with a bag. There's very few instances where we go in for elective surgery with a plan to do a bag. So elective surgery on patients, their, their colon is usually bowel prepped, meaning you drink the same drink that you do for colonoscopy. You drink that drink for colon surgery as well in order to limit the risk of infection. Um, the colon itself is healthy. Most times there's no problems with, um, with uh, blood flow or inflammation. And so I would say 95 to 98% of the time we go in there with the intention of doing a connection and putting and joining together of the intestine and the patient will not need a bag. Uh, so it's the exception rather than the rule that the patient will have a bag. Um, traditionally, these connections were done with uh, sutures or stitches. Um, nowadays, we utilize staples. Um, they're equivalent in terms of their uh, success rate in terms of keeping the, the bowel together and healing. But what's the best use of staplers is low down in the pelvis. And you could see here, this is what's called an end-to-end -end anastomosis or an end-to-end -end connection, where we're deep down in the, in the recesses of the abdomen and the pelvis, as you saw in the, lace, in the last video, where uh, it's almost impossible to get an instrument down there and do a good connection. And so, you know, adequately uh, get two portions of, of the intestine together. So what we can do is put a portion of the stapler in the rectum, another one on top, connect the two. Um, there's a male end and a female end, and they, um, they fire the stapler and the two, and the ring of staples actually uh, is created and puts the bowel together. Um, so this allows us to do lower connections, lower anastomoses, and a higher likelihood of saving the muscles um, and the ability to have a normal bowel movement. So it actually lowers the, the need for a bag uh, in most patients. Uh, important principles of performing a connection, we wanna make sure that the, that the bowel that we're putting back together is uh, healthy, has adequate blood supply, and it's not on tension, it's not pulling apart. And that's why we, we check all these things prior to putting the intestines together. And this is another, uh, another uh, a diagram of how we make the, the anastomosis. You put a stapler in both ends and then you close the common channel. Um, we could skip this. This is similar to the prior one. Um, so one of the ways in which we uh, assess the, the blood flow to the colon is something called endocyanine green angiography. And this is something that we can do in real time. We inject uh, a, um, oops, sorry. We inject a chemical called ICG or indocyanine green in the IV of the patient under, while they're having surgery. And in real time under the camera, we could see the green part is all the, the part of the colon that has blood flow. And whatever is not turning green, um, and this is a camera optics, this is not actually the colon turning green, but whatever is not green is not getting adequate blood flow. And then that tells us basically where we can cut uh, to maintain a healthy connection and uh, satisfactory healing. So this is about the last five years we've been using this in the operating room. So not all cancers are created equal. Some are in the colon proper, which is in the upper abdomen, but some are in the rectum. Um, the rectum is the lowest part. This is traditionally something that we can palpate or we can feel with a finger. If we put a finger in the rectum, a rectal exam, you can feel a cancer or a polyp in the rectum. And some, some of these polyps or cancers are too large to be removed with uh, a colonoscopy. And to do surgery for these, um, for these masses would require either uh, a temporary bag or even a permanent bag. So in certain patients, we can do something called TAMIS, which is transanal minimally invasive surgery. And essentially, it's, it's a, uh, a, la a sort of a laparoscopic port or a plug that's placed in the anus itself. We blow up the colon with gas, similar to a colonoscopy. And as you could see in this diagram, we use instruments um, 
to remove the polyp under direct vision. So this allows us to avoid the need for a large surgery with incisions or even laparoscopic surgery, and it allows the patients to keep their, uh, their normal bowel habits and, and most importantly, their, their uh, anal muscles so that they could avoid a bag. Uh, this is a robotic uh, transanal minimally invasive surgery, which they're doing in certain areas. And you can see we're actually working inside the colon itself uh, to remove this, uh, this polyp or early cancer. And you can actually see the uh, layers of the colon. They're removing the polyp layer by layer. And um, let me just skip ahead. You can see they're demarcating the area. removing the deeper layers of the, uh, of the tumor. And this allows us to better, uh, to eliminate, to get a better stage of, of the tumor itself. And we'll find out if there's any lymph nodes involved. But most of these patients, we already know that they're early stage. So the treatment is the removal of the mass itself. And very few would require any additional therapy after this, rather than having a large surgery, as I discussed earlier in the slides and in the, in the presentation. And they're actually using a suture to close the defect that was created, um, and that will allow the area to heal more expeditiously. There are other newer uh, transluminal uh, or lap or colonoscopic types of uh, surgeries. This is. Looks like it's straight out of Terminator 2, but it's a sort of uh, uh, colonoscopy with a camera with two arms, and they could actually work in the um, in the lumen inside the colon itself and do uh, polyp or cancer removal similar to the one I just showed, but can go even higher than the uh, prior instrument instrumentation was able to. Future directions for surgery, um, many uh, institutions are now trialing single incision robotic surgery. So that means instead of having the four or five small um, uh, tubes that go in the abdomen, they're making uh, a medium-sized uh, cut in the belly button area, putting uh, a device that has three arms within it and doing the surgery through what's called a single incision. So that will obviously eliminate uh, a lot of the pain that patients have even further, and it's also more cosmetic, and which leads us to what's called transrectal extraction or even natural orifice extraction. So certain individuals can have their uh, colon removed rather than through the abdomen. They'll have the laparoscopic tubes placed in the abdomen, but, but instead of making an incision to remove the disease portion of the colon, um, we'll remove it either through the rectum itself or in certain instances through uh, the vagina, um, which would then be closed again. So this eliminates the need for a larger abdominal incision and a quicker recovery. All in all, these patients have their, their, uh, the portion of the colon that's removed sent to the pathology lab uh, with the lymph nodes involved. It will get evaluated and tested. They, they stage the patients and ultimately we'll get at about uh, 10, seven to 10 days, we'll get a pathology report that will determine the next step for the patient, whether it's surveillance or chemotherapy. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Schusterman who will discuss uh, the oncology aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. And thank you for all the visuals and the videos. It was very cool. Um, so yeah, I, with that being said, I would like to turn the program over to Dr. Michael Shusterman. Uh, he's going to give us some updates in medical oncology. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I'll try to speak quickly because there's a lot to talk about and a lot of exciting updates uh, that have happened in literally just the last few years. Um, actually, I should say maybe literally in the last two months um, in the medical oncology space. Um, and uh, so hopefully we'll get to cover some of it. We can't cover everything, but uh, I'm excited to share um, some of the latest uh, and newest developments. Uh, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest. I am going to talk about some things that are investigational, although they are commercially available. So it's important um, to consider that as discussing with, uh, with your oncologist. Um, we're primarily going to focus on uh, adjuvant therapy, which is where most people might meet uh, 
medical oncologists like myself, a gastrointestinal oncologist, which is um, after surgery, uh, receiving chemotherapy. We're going to talk a bit about um, some of the newer technology that's now available to us, just like that kind of cool, almost Terminator uh, ro surgical robot. Uh, we have some very cool technology that uh, we can use with blood tests. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the really interesting uh, molecular data that's now coming out for colon cancer as well. So I just wanted to frame this around the context of um, a case of, uh, of a person. Um, the details are different, but this is very similar to someone that I had seen in the last year. It, so if we imagine a 45-year-old woman who was previously healthy comes for consultation after a low anterior resection, much as was, was described to us for a rectal sigmoid cancer, because um, she had noticed rectal bleeding and she went appropriately for a colonoscopy and then saw a surgeon and underwent a uh, resection of the tumor. And uh, the operative pathology report comes back and it says this is a stage 3B tumor. And then it says it's a PT3N1A tumor. There's one of 30 lymph nodes positive. And then there's something about it being mismatch repair proficient. Um, and, and, and the surgeon says that you should see a medical oncologist to talk about this and you know, try to reduce your risk of the cancer coming back. Um, and uh, somebody like this might come to see me and they might say, well, you know, why do I have to do chemotherapy? Um, how, how can I do the least amount of chemotherapy I can? I'm young. I don't want to, you know, spend, be exposed to chemotherapy for long periods of time if I can be. And, and how can I get the most benefit out of this? Um, so, so we're going to talk a bit about that. But the first thing really is to think about, like, what, what are these stages? What does this mean? Like, what, you know, what in the world is this? Um, and the easiest way to think about the colon is it's a tube, right? And it has layers. Um, and it has different layers. And a, a tumor, when it starts as a polyp, um, tends to grow for both out into the canal of the colon, but it also tends to grow in through the layers of the wall. And the further out into the layers of the wall it goes, the more advanced we call it the tumor stage. And if the tumor gets into any of these kind of like red uh, or green vessels, which are kind of the blood vessels of the lymph nodes, then we say that it's gotten into the lymph nodes. Um, so a, a stage two tumor means that it's still within the wall of the uh, colon, or it has spread outside of the wall and may be floating, kind of free floating, kind of perforating through the wall, but it hasn't gotten into any of the lymph nodes. A stage three tumor, which is more similar to the case of uh, the person that we talked about, is also still potentially within the wall or can be outside the wall, but by definition has to be within the lymph nodes. And the number of lymph nodes that are involved says which stage uh, this tumor is in. So an early stage tumor, which is in the wall, and only in a certain number of lymph nodes, it will be an early stage 3A tumor. A stage 3B has either more spread or more lymph node involvement. And a stage 3C tumor has very extensive spread through the wall and many lymph nodes, which may be involved. So that's kind of the context of what, what we're talking about when we say, what is the stage of the tumor? Um, the other thing to think about is, you know, well, okay, so, but, you know, one of our, the surgeon just said they took everything out. So why, why are we even worried about this? They took out all the lymph nodes, they took out the tumor. What could, what could possibly be going on? Well, the important thing to think about here is kind of just like we showed that if the tumor has these blood vessels and lymphatic vessels that are feeding it, it is technically possible for that tumor to spread over time from the cells and kind of travel both into the lymph nodes, but also into the bloodstream. And if it's done that at the time of surgery, right? So maybe maybe you'd had your CAT scan or maybe you'd uh, done some treatment beforehand, depending on the situation, but there might be cells now floating through the bloodstream. And if we wait long enough, uh, these cells could travel and spread to other organs or other lymph nodes and they could grow and form new tumors. And we wanna to try to catch these cells early by using therapy that eliminates them within the bloodstream and so reduces the risk of a tumor coming back. So, you know, this is kind of what you see if you go on the NCCN guidelines. Um, you know, what can you do? If, if a patient or as a physician, you know, if you go on this, it, it's kind of a indecipherable. I think to most people, it makes absolutely no sense what, what, what this is. Um, and so really the easiest way to think about it um, is, is this, and it's kind of the most 
that's kind of the most straightforward. We've, we've actually mathematically modeled um, over the last several years risk. And this is for stage three colon cancer. This is the one in which we recommend chemotherapy for most people. I, I'm not gonna talk about stage two because it gets very tricky and um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a very long discussion about pluses and minuses. But in essence, as the earlier your stage is, the less fewer lymph nodes involved in the less stage, the less likely your tumor is to come back. So you have almost an 80% chance of just surgery getting rid of your tumor. The further along you are, unfortunately, the risk of a tumor coming back is much, much, much higher. And so chemotherapy adds more and more benefit as you go along uh, in time. So how much benefit? Well, in fact, um, these numbers may be sometimes a little bit scary to think about. And luckily, most people are found early on. But if you have a very, very late tumor, the surgery by itself is almost equivalent to the benefit of chemotherapy, which is why we really stress trying to catch tumors early before they even become tumors or getting a colonoscopy when uh, they're still very early on. So I'm gonna go through this quickly. It's not as important as the numbers, but what to say is that we basically proved very early on that using two chemotherapy drugs together, an infusion pump and a uh, infusion, second infusion drug really significantly improves up to almost a 70 or 80% rate for many patients, um, you know, the chances of the tumor not coming back. And um, the problem with this was unfortunately that by doing so, we gave a lot of people a really unpleasant side effect, which is numbness and tingling in their hands and their feet. And, you know, even up to four, three or four years later, a lot of people had uh, a lot of numbness and tingling um, from this. So, you know, we wanted to ask the question, could we reduce the risk of people getting numbness and tingling, but keep the same benefit of preventing the tumors from coming back? And so a very large study was done with almost 13,000 people across the world. It's probably one of the largest clinical trials that's been run in oncology. Um, and it basically looked at if we gave people three months of chemo versus six months, and if you believe it or not, uh, we used to give people 12 months of chemotherapy. So this was already an improvement. Um, it was, could we get the exact same benefit? Was it no worse to do this? And one thing that we showed 100% was that depending on the, whichever chemotherapy regimen you got, either with an oral version or a purely infusional version, the rate at six months of getting really bad nerve injury was almost, you know, I would say 50% if you did six months, but almost a third of that if you did three months. So we definitely showed that the rates of nerve damage were substantially reduced. But the big question was, was the rate of benefit still the same? And so this is what came out of that trial. And honestly, um, it uh, didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. And I think if you look at this table, it probably would take an hour to figure out what's going on. There's yellow and red and all this stuff. But the long answer is that it was <laughs> complicated. The short answer is that um, we basically showed that for most people, you can get away with three months of chemotherapy. If you're an early, low-risk tumor, three months with kind of one of the very standard classic regimens that we use was sufficient. You might need to do somewhere for three to six months with another version of the chemo, and for, six, and for the high-risk tumors, you really probably still needed the six months. So for our patients, three months of chemotherapy may just be just fine and give her the exact same benefit as having done six months and reduced her risk of numbness and tingling. So, you know, kind of going back to this table, you know, doing this, uh, just, the, this just the three months with the exiloplatin really would give her a very nice benefit and very little benefit. This is actually where this table comes from, that trial, you know, only a 1% chance for an extra three, three months of reducing risk. But then things got really complicated. And the reason why it got complicated is because we developed new technology and we showed that actually we can detect the microscopic DNA of tumor cells in the blood, which was stunning because quite frankly, that's what we're looking for, right? We're trying to prove that there's microscopic DNA in the blood and we really wanna demonstrate that we're getting rid of it. So we can actually now detect these DNA molecules floating through people's blood. And it's actually an extrapolation of technology 
that was used for prenatal testing, where if a baby was in a mother, we could actually detect the baby's DNA in the mother's DNA, um, and we actually extrapolated that technology to oncology. There's two ways of doing this. And um, basically, you can either just test the blood, and the easiest way to think about it is, is you just do a blood test and you look for generic markers. You just look for colon DNA. Um, it's more, way more complicated than that, but that's basically the sense of it. Or you can create a customized blood test. You could actually take that tumor that was taken out during the surgery, and you can then take that tumor and create a custom blood test just for you. The easiest example is you go to a store, you buy shoes off the rack, where you go to a shoe tailor, which very few people do nowadays, and you get a shoe made just for you. They both will fit, one will fit better. And the reason why this is pretty cool is because before, the only way we really had, if the CAT scan didn't show anything, of detecting things was PEA, which is a kind of an old protein marker that some cells make, some don't. And really all this is trying to say is, is that most of the time, until you get to really high levels, CEA has a very high risk of being just falsely positive and really doesn't say much. So uh, a lot of work has been done. There's one uh, company in particular that most of these studies are coming from, and they demonstrated that, this, that their test basically of doing like a, a couture, a bespoke version of this study, of this test, of just using customizing it to your tumor actually is better than pretty much anything else at predicting risk of the tumor coming back because you're literally detecting the tumor in the blood. It's like a 40 times higher risk if you detect this test as compared to almost any of the other classic things we used to know about. So the Japanese recently have just released their, the first data of just observing what we have, what this, this test can show us, and it's called the GALAXY trial. And I won't go through the rest of these because it's kind of complicated, but basically what, what it said and if you haven't looked at these graphs before, the, the easiest way to think about these is the higher the numbers are to 100, the better it is, the lower they are, the, the not so good. So here in this red line, these are people who had stage two and three tumors who did not have the CT DNA. They didn't have tumor DNA in their blood and they did great, basically. 12 months, 95% of them didn't have evidence of any tumors, even if they were high risk. But if the CT DNA was found, there was actually a, a high risk of finding uh, the tumors come back. So that's informative by and of itself. But also what they demonstrated was that if, the, if you gave chemotherapy and you actually got rid of the CT DNA uh, in the blood, so if you went from being positive to negative, it was almost as good as if you never had DNA to begin with. So if the chemo works to get rid of the, the tumor cells in your blood, that's great. You're in the same place as you are as somebody who didn't have it in the first place. Again, if it was still there, it was a higher risk situation. Um, and this was basically showing that, in fact, there are some people who actually don't, might not even need chemotherapy because they didn't get chemo for whatever reason, and they were CT DNA negative. They didn't have the circulating tumor DNA, and they did great. They did just as well as people who got chemo. So this was really intriguing. And this has led to a trial that uh, probably will be opening uh, pretty soon at NYU. It's a national study called Circulate US. It's the national equivalent of the Japanese study. And it's going to be looking at in low risk individuals, whether we can use CT DNA to potentially avoid chemotherapy altogether. So if you don't have CT DNA, could you avoid chemotherapy altogether and just be intensively monitored with the blood test with scans? And if you do have the DNA, then get chemotherapy at different, different intensities. And if you do have CT DNA, can we use different types of chemotherapy to try to get you back to a place where we can get rid of these tumors? So this is super exciting, um, and it's really probably going to be the future of therapy. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to tell one more one more story, which I hopefully will get in here. And this is really like to me the most one of the most exciting things. So so this is the story of molecular biology. So at this point, this is somebody who comes in. They're 35, and unfortunately, their tumor has spread outside of the colon. It's causing this person a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. But because, they, so they come, so they came to our office and we did uh, basically molecular sequencing, next generation sophisticated testing, along with kind of classic immunohistochemical stains, which are basically dye stains. And we demonstrated that this person had something called mismatch repair deficiency, which means their tumor was missing certain proteins that allowed the, uh, that, that allowed the tumor to replicate kind of in an irregular way. 
And we actually also send CT DNA to watch their tumor also. And we know that you know, tumors in different sides of the colon actually express these markers more so. We're more sensitive to this. There's a lot of genetic changes that we know about. And we also knew just recently, I mean, this came out probably in the last few, it was a few years ago this trial came out, that using immune therapy for these mismatched repair deficient tumors can be very effective and you don't need to use chemotherapy. And what we actually have shown is that about 10% of people might actually effectively have their tumors melt away, which with chemotherapy, the most intensive chemotherapy we used to give was maybe three or 4%. It's basically you know, a 300% increase. And, we're, and then other people, their tumors shrink or stay very well controlled for basically years at a time. And this was very exciting because this gentleman had a remarkable response to therapy. In fact, in somebody who might previously have been on chemo and had many side effects, this is the levels of the tumor DNA in their blood. He basically was making tons and tons of tumor DNA. This is a real test to essentially know DNA in the blood. And the CAT scan showed the same thing. So this is just a really exciting application of novel technology that we now have, and we can literally see real time our new molecular and immunotherapy is working. There's a lot of other markers. I can't even go into all of these. You know, this is lectures and talks in and of themselves, which are really exciting. There's KRAS wild type. We can now use ctDNA for that. There's BRAF mutations with novel therapies that we're applying for melanoma. HER2 positive, which is a breast cancer marker that we're now using in colon cancer and new therapy for that. What we talked about was pembrolizumab, which is immunotherapy. There's NTREC fusions, and it's just so important to do this next generation sequencing um, to uh, determine uh, the optimal therapy for a given tumor. So just some final thoughts. Um, less may be more now in adjuvant settings, so that's post-surgical settings for many patients. Really, the future is probably going to be these ctDNA tests and these large multinational studies that we're running. And in an advanced disease, there are more options, there are possibly more definitive options that we never had before. And it's really being driven by these new molecular uh, therapies that we have available. So that's it. Uh, thanks so much. And I know that was kind of a whirlwind uh, tour. Thank you, Dr. Schusterman, that was great. Uh, before we move on, I just have a follow-up question here of something that you mentioned. Uh, someone asked the tumor agnostic testing for this CT DNA. Yes, there is. So that's the second type of test. So tumor agnostic testing, um, basically what we would call tumor uninformed testing. So it's uh, basically uses um, just the blood testing. It's available through, there's another company. So the company that I talked about, uh, I own no stock or representation in these companies, just I guess I was mentioning it for conflicts of interest purposes. So the, and it's commercially available. So Signaterra is the test that is tumor informed and Garden Reveal is the test that's tumor not informed. So it's just a blood test and it just looks for um, DNA uh, signatures um, and genes that might be mutated in colon cancer. So those are the two different ways of doing it, like uh, Nike shoe on the store or getting a custom Nike shoe made by Nike for you, I, I guess. That's a great so, analogy, I like that. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, last but not least, I would like to introduce our last speaker for this evening. Uh, Rebecca Gutterman, she is a registered dietitian here at Perlmutter Cancer Center, and she's going to talk to us about nutrition while undergoing treatment. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, so before treatment, there have been shown things that could actually decrease our risk of colorectal cancer. So we want to make sure that we are doing things that will decrease our risk. Um, eating whole grains and foods containing fiber have been shown to be beneficial. Daily moderate physical activity is always important as well. Things that increase the risk could be excess body fat, consuming processed meats, eating a large amount of red meat, and drinking two or more alcoholic drinks daily. So these are definitely things that we want to keep in mind that we could change our behaviors and actually modify our risk for colorectal cancer. If you have been diagnosed and you are going through treatment, um, especially with chemotherapy and or radiation therapy, it is very important to eat to maintain your nutritional status. So if you're struggling to eat due to treatment side effects, 
you want to choose foods that are going to be as tolerated as possible. Usually this entails eating multiple small meals a day, many meals, some snacks, that helps to make sure that you're eating adequately. And if you're physically able, trying to get regular exercise will help maintain your muscle mass and your strength. You could try eating a bigger breakfast. A lot of people find that the morning is the time of the day when they are hungriest. So I often tell people to flip flop their meal choices, choose breakfast foods in the evenings and eat more dinner type foods in the morning if that's something that you think your body can tolerate. You also want to report your symptoms to your medical team because there are medications and different things that we could help to recommend or prescribe that will help reduce some of these symptoms. So some of the things that I talk to patients about are dietary modifications. So for example, if you are having nausea during your treatment, you would want to eat bland and starchy foods between your meals. Often keeping something in your stomach throughout the day helps decrease that feeling of nausea. You would want to avoid foods with strong smells. Choose foods that are cold or at room temperature because they have less odor than hot foods. And oftentimes people are left being a little bit sensitive to smells of food. You want to choose foods that are soft and moist. These are gonna be less likely to make the nausea worse. And using ginger products, um, boiling ginger root, using ginger tea or ginger candies, all of the ginger does help settle the stomach to make you feel a little bit better throughout the day. If you are having diarrhea, you wanna eat bland or low fiber foods. So you would wanna peel the skins of fruits, chop and cook your vegetables and choose foods that are softer in texture. So often these are the more refined grains or you want to really overcook some of your grains to make them more tolerable. Fried, greasy, or spicy foods are more likely to cause problems, so you would want to avoid those. To replace some of the electrolytes that you have lost, especially if you are having diarrhea throughout the day, you would want to drink low sugar electrolyte fluids or eat foods such as bananas and potatoes. Those, in addition to having a lot of potassium in them, are also binding. Applesauce and white rice are also food choices that are binding. So good to be including at your meals if you are having active diarrhea because of chemotherapy or treatments. If you are having fatigue, which is a very common side effect with a lot of these medications, you want to keep easy to prepare foods on hand, things that don't require very much cooking that you could just grab out of the pantry or the refrigerator and have a meal or a snack ready very quickly. Also, if you are feeling more energized at specific times of the day or specific days of the week, you can make and freeze extra foods when you feel up to it. You wanna choose foods that are easy to eat. It's just gonna be more tolerable for you to get the full meal in if something's easy to eat. It's important that you stay hydrated. And again, that physical activity, you do wanna move around throughout the day. Weight loss is a very common side effect with um, treatment. So you wanna eat by the clock. You don't wanna rely on your hunger signals to tell you when it's meal time, like we normally do. We want to really eat on a schedule. Look at how long it's been since your prior meal to make sure that you get your next one ready. You wanna eat protein rich foods with all meals and snacks. You wanna pack snacks with you at all times. If you're out of the house for doctor's appointments, for treatment visits, for outings with family, you wanna make sure that you have something to eat with you. And when you're home, keep food next to you throughout the day. Um, that's a good way to make it easier to eat. And the easier we can make it to eat, the better we will eat. You could also consider supplementing with high calorie or high protein nutritional drinks or homemade smoothies. You may need to further modify some of these diet recommendations if you're eating to prevent a bowel obstruction or if you have had surgery and have had a colostomy or ileostomy. During your treatment, food safety is also important um, because a lot of the chemotherapies, the traditional ones, do weaken the immune system. So safe food handling practices help reduce the risk of foodborne illness. 
very simple things, wash your hands, avoid cross-contamination, which means don't cut your salad on the cutting board where you just cut your raw chicken. You want to make sure that you don't leave perishable foods on the counter. So refrigerate foods if they are um, left out for more than an hour or so. We don't want them out for more than two hours. You wanna rinse all fruits and vegetables under warm running water. But if it is labeled as ready to eat or washed, we don't need to wash those things again. We want to avoid raw, rare, or undercooked meat, poultry, and fish. Um, no runny yolks, no medium rare meats. We want to only choose pasteurized milk and cheeses. We want to heat certain foods so that risk of them containing bacteria is reduced. If you are eating out, you want to check the inspection scores for restaurants or eat at places that you've been to and you know are kept clean. If you take those foods home with you, eat those leftovers within three to four days. Again, all of these practices are to reduce the risk of foodborne illness. After treatment, if you've gone through surgery or chemotherapy, if you have um, had any of those different treatments, you will want to follow a plant-based diet. Um, a diet that is high in fiber, antioxidants, and phytochemicals helps prevent cancer recurrence. You want to eat adequate protein that helps build, repair, or maintain muscle strength. Um, Protein helps strengthen your immune system. And there are plenty of plant-based foods that can provide adequate protein. You wanna eat your fruits and vegetables. It sounds simple, we say we hear it a lot, but it's truly important to help reduce the risk of recurrence. We wanna eat five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. The more colors, the better. Um, that indicates the different nutrients are present in our diet. And we want to make sure that we have all of those different benefits. When we choose grains, we want to choose mostly whole grain foods. They'll have more fiber and they'll have more nutrients. So they're just, they will just be better for you. And there are options that are in whole wheat bread. There are plenty of other whole grains available. I've mentioned protein a lot. Um, seafood and poultry are our primary animal proteins that we would wanna be consuming. Again, because red and processed meats have been linked with a higher incidence of colorectal cancer, we wanna avoid those. We want to eat those plant foods, like I've also said already, um, and those are beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Um, so the American Institute for Cancer Research recommends less than 18 ounces per week of red meat and any beef, pork, lamb, or goat are considered red meats. And really avoiding those processed meats, trying not to buy them, don't bring them into the house, don't order them on the side with your meals, really eat these very infrequently, if ever at all. There are different types of fats in our foods. Omega-3 fatty acids have been shown to be particularly beneficial. Not all fat is bad. Um, Omega-3s are essential in the diet because the body does not produce them. They help reduce inflammation and they're found in a variety of different foods, um, mostly seafoods, salmon, mackerel, sardines, herring, um, but also things like flax seeds and chia seeds and walnuts. You wanna limit the saturated fats. These are the more unhealthy fats for us. You could think of them as solid at room temperature. They're the fats that are found within the meats and the poultry skins. They're in butter and cheese and full fat dairy, as well as the tropical oils, palm and coconut. Physical activity, we've said it many times, um, you wanna move your body. 30 minutes of low impact exercise per day has been shown to be beneficial in keeping you strong and also maintaining a healthy weight. This all being said, these recommendations can change depending on your symptoms, if they're present from current treatment or lingering post-treatment. This is a very simple way to visualize what a healthy meal looks like. So you could see that half of the plate are these non-starchy vegetables. So this is the majority of what we wanna eat in our diet. 
a quarter of the plate is a lean protein, and then a quarter of the plate is starch. So if you could imagine your meals on a plate that's similar to this, it doesn't have to be the food shown in the picture, it's just an example, but you do wanna model your plate to look similar to this. It's a proper distribution of portions at meals. And how do I know if a diet is recommended to follow? There is so much information out there when it comes to diet and especially with cancer. So first and foremost, I always advocate for asking to speak with a registered dietitian through your doctor's office. They should have somebody that they could connect you to. And if you're reading online, if you're doing some Googling yourself, you want to make sure that you are finding reputable information. So ask yourself who's benefiting from the information. Is it being promoted by someone who has financial incentives to sell a product? Does the diet include products that you have to buy to make it successful? Are they citing patient testimonials or evidence-based research? Is the practitioner qualified and credentialed to be giving diet advice? There are a lot of people out there who call themselves nutritionists that don't necessarily have the same background and education as registered dietitians. So you ultimately wanna ask yourself, does this sound too good to be true? You wanna make sure you're doing the right things for your body and not doing anything that could put yourself at higher risk for anything down the road. These are some reputable resources. Um, they use evidence-based information. They have different recipes, different nutrition tips and lifestyle um, recommendations to get you through before, during, or after your cancer treatment journey. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. That was so helpful. That was really informative. We really appreciate that. Um, and if you wouldn't mind leaving the resource of the last slide up just for another yeah. moment, just in case anyone wants to jot that down. Um, thank you so much. And with that being said, that is it. Um, if anyone has any questions, we can wait a couple minutes. Uh, just type it into the Q&A box at the bottom. I know a couple questions have already been answered. Looks like that is it. So with that being said, thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Thank you to our expert panel. That was a wonderful presentation and so informative. And thank you so much for your time. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.